we uh, pause a moment before we get into the Word, I thank you for your Holy Spirit. We know, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is really our teacher, that we don't need any, any man to teach us if we have the Word and we have your Holy Spirit. And so I would just thank you that your Holy Spirit is our teacher. And that as this message is presented as your message, Lord, might we set aside the things that sort of distract us from listening carefully or being aware of what you might be saying to us. Even if it doesn't pertain directly to, to what might be spoken, Lord, we know that your Holy Spirit can guide us into your truth. And so help us set aside the distractions and listen to you. And Father, as I give myself over to your control, I would pray that your Holy Spirit will speak through me so the Word of God is clearly and accurately communicated here this morning. That as a result of being here, that ministry of the Holy Spirit will continue with each person. Your Word has told us that our minds are like soil and that we each have the opportunity to, to see the Word of God as seed being sown in our minds. So, Father, make us receptive to your word so that it grows and bears fruit, that it changes the way we look at life, that it changes the way we behave. I thank you for this time, and I thank you for each person. Motivate us to respond to your word so that we're doers of the word and not hearers only. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, this is the end of the section I said from Haggai. Haggai was a prophet who went to Jerusalem among the exiles that were there. After they hit their roadblock and were unable to continue to rebuild the temple, he showed up. Nothing's really known about Haggai. There's not a lot in the Bible about him. We don't, we don't have a list of who his parents were. We don't know what city he was from. But he showed up there to bring them a message from God. And he started out with kind of a bleak kind of a challenging message, you know, and he, and he kind of reminded them of the failure that had been taking place in the last 20-some years, because once the building stopped, the royal edict had been given, it, it seemed to me like everybody in Jerusalem that had gone back to rebuild the temple was rocked back on their heels. Now, all of a sudden, what do we do? So they did what they could, and they rebuilt their own homes, they planted their own gardens, they established life there in Jerusalem, and they waited. And during that waited period, a certain amount of complacency began to build into their lives. And by the time Haggai came, which could have been 20 years later, he said, how are you guys doing this? You're living in houses with paneling and enjoying the good life, while my house, the temple, is still not even built. And so he begins his book by challenging the people to consider their lifestyles, to consider their... their uh, priorities, and they responded. The great thing is when you read the first chapter and the beginning of the second chapter, you realize the people in Jerusalem responded to Haggai's message. It tells us that they feared the Lord, and then they obeyed what God said. And that's the, that's the order it has to be in. My wife and I were talking about that this week, how fear of the Lord is, is a missing component in, in our lives in so many ways and in our society's life. But I'm saying for individual Christians, where's our fear of the Lord? I don't know if we actually sit and ponder, what does it mean to fear the Lord? Do you fear the Lord? Do you realize He holds your life in His hands? That He is the God that holds eternity in, our hand, in His hands? That this is a God that can grant us life or death? As simple as that. Do we fear the Lord enough when we see His Word, we respond to it? When God tells us in His Word to do something, do we go, yes, let's do it? I always use the illustration of me fearing my father. I loved my father. He was a gentle man, a nice man, but I feared him. When he raised his voice and said, stop it, we stopped. Because I knew my father. And maybe that's the problem, that our fear of the Lord isn't what it ought to be because we really don't know the Lord. We really don't know God's character. But read the Old Testament and read the New Testament, and I'm saying this is in both Testaments, the fear of the Lord is something real that needs to be sought after. We need to ask God to implant in our hearts a fear of the Lord so that we can begin bringing back worship. And in this passage of Scripture, we have Haggai receiving another message from God after he's challenged the people. They seem to have responded to it. 
The Lord has already promised them, I've got all the resources necessary. If you get back to work, I've got all the resources necessary. You'll be able to accomplish everything I want you to accomplish, which is a promise that we have as well. Now in this passage of Scripture, there's one more condition that God's people needed to meet before they were really ready to bring back worship. One condition had to be met. And that condition is spelled out for us, uh, is illustrated, I think, in three different parts in this passage of Scripture. Okay, it's look, talking about one condition, three different parts. First of all, it starts in verses 10 through 14 with the current condition of the people to whom Haggai was ministering. And he begins this passage by saying, this is what the Lord Almighty says, ask the priest what the law says. Now that's an interesting thing to state to God's people who are in Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. They know the law, right? I mean, they're Jews. They've had the law. They've, they've maintained it all the time they were in captivity. But here God is saying to His people, now I want you to check into the law and begin to consider what it's saying. I want you to think about it. I want you to, and I want you to go to the priests and ask them because they know about the law, okay? The people have agreed to go back to work. God's saying, I'll honor that. That desire to go back to work is great. You know, fear the Lord, go back to work. But I want you to think about something from the point of view of what you're about to do. When we talk about bringing back worship, what does that mean we're about to do? See, for the early Jews returning to Jerusalem, the temple had been destroyed. It sounded like manual labor, didn't it? Hauling bricks, hauling blocks of stone, putting thing up, you know, furnishing it, getting the routine and the ritual going again. And so they had a lot of work to do, all right? But Haggai wants to make something really clear before they start even considering reinstating worship practices. And so in verses 12 through 13, he challenges, or God challenges his people to consider what is consecration. You know, it's stated here, isn't it, about consecrated food. We don't always think about that because we don't make a big deal about that. In our tradition, we, we just talk about things in everyday terms, and we don't think about something being consecrated. This building has been consecrated to the Lord's work. It doesn't make it a holy place, but it is a place set aside for God's use. Okay? It's been consecrated. It comes... It's, that word means something to the effect of coming into, coming into contact with the sacred, consecrated, with sacred. Okay, so as he talks about consecration, he says, ask the priests about this. If you have uh, something that has been consecrated, a consecrated piece of meat, all right, something you are offering to God, and it's wrapped in a cloth, and as you're carrying it, to the temple to offer to God, a, a, a part of that cloth touches something on the way. Does it make that something that it touches consecrated? What was the priest's answer? No, it doesn't, okay? That piece of meat was consecrated. The fold or the cloth that it's wrapped in doesn't make everything it touches consecrated, okay? That sounds simple. And he goes, so, you know, what determines that? Does contact determine it? No, contact doesn't determine it. What defiles it? That's the next question he asked. If you have a person who has been defiled by touching a dead body, and if you look in the Old Testament, anybody who came in contact with a dead body was considered unclean for a number of days. They actually had to go through a purification process after coming into contact with a dead body. And it didn't matter whose dead body, it didn't matter what the circumstances were, you were considered unclean. So he says someone has been in contact with a dead body, so if they touch something else, do they... If they touch a holy thing, what happens? Does it make the holy thing, or does the holy thing make that thing clean? No, it defiles the holy thing. We understand that well enough, right? I was thinking, how can I illustrate this? Let's have a picnic down at the beach. And you bring your food, and you set it on a picnic table. You've got it in your lunch bag, right? When you set your lunch bag on that picnic table, does it disinfect it? When you take the food out of your lunch box and you got a, a naked sandwich, 
unprotected by anything, and you lay it on that table, does it make the table clean? What does it do? It defiles the sandwich, doesn't it? Who, how many seagulls have been popping around on that table? <laughs> you got to ask yourself those questions. Haggai says, we understand that principle. The unholy defiles the holy. And you guys are on the verge of bringing back worship. He's saying to his people, I want you to think about what makes something holy so you don't misunderstand what's going to be happening. Once you reestablish worship, you start coming into the presence of God. You start offering sacrifices to God, seeking cleansing from sin. What's the tendency going to be? And they knew what the tendency was. And in case they didn't, Haggai spells it out. He applies the principle in verse 14. He says, so it is with this people and this nation. So what is? Defilement. You guys are on the verge of bringing back worship and, and, and acknowledging once again that I am your God. But you've got to understand that no matter what you do with the temple, if you aren't right with God, you will defile the temple. It doesn't work the other way around. Now that's a blast of insight. That's an important lesson. Because so many times we think that coming into a consecrated place will make me right with God. That it will somehow consecrate me. But the opposite is actually true when you have a group of people, and of course the temple in the New Testament is described as the body of Christ, the church, not the church building, but the people of Christ. But when we gather together and the Holy Spirit is working among us, we don't automatically purify everybody that walks into a gathering in fact, the opposite is true. That's why I emphasize to you all the time, you got to examine your heart attitude toward God. Because when you're not walking with God, you know who it affects? Me. When I'm not walking with God, you know who it affects? You. Because the defilement works that way. When our lives aren't right with God, we will defile no matter what we do. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6, the Apostle Paul was writing to a church in Corinth who, who were tolerating sin in their church. They were allowing it to continue. And Paul said to them, your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast. So that you may be a new unleavened batch. So as you really are. For Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. To use the analogy of the Passover where they got rid of all the leavening in the house. All the yeast. And he says you guys need to get rid of the yeast. You need to make sure you are pure. Don't glory in your toleration. Rather understand the nature of holiness and defilement and realize that if we are going to embark on a trail of once again making corporate worship a big part of what our lifestyle is and what our mental processes involve, we have to make sure we, each one of us, maintain the consecration that we receive through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. How do we maintain it? The Bible is pretty clear. We confess our sins, he's faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 9. A verse I learned as a little kid and have never lost the appreciation for. That what God desires is his people to, to, to recognize their current condition so that they can adjust their lifestyle accordingly and realize that bringing back worship is going to mean there's going to be some changes taking place. A lot of the things that we do in a worship service actually center around, hopefully, that process. We don't always think about it. We don't always emphasize it enough. But even when we stand in front and give announcements, we're kind of killing time. Why is that? Because we figure when people are gathered together, they're not used to being in the presence of God. They might need a little time to just reorient their thinking and start thinking about the corporate body of Christ and what's their responsibility. Then we like to read the Bible. So you hear the Word of God. We like to sing a song that glorifies God. That's not just for your entertainment. I don't, I don't, I'm sure you didn't 
think it was. But it's not for your entertainment. That's not why we have praise bands or, or worship groups. That's not entertainment. That's not why we're doing it. <clears throat> we're doing it because we want to begin to realign your thinking to the things of God so that before the message is brought, you are preparing yourself to be consecrated worshipers. So worship then takes on a whole new dynamic when you realize actually everything we're doing together on a Sunday morning is focused at you realigning yourself back to God's Word. And so in verses 15 through 19, the thing that follows that is undeserved favor. And in verses 15 and 16, God emphasizes to them their own personal Failure. He says, give careful thought. He says, I want you to think back before the temple was rebuilt. Okay? There was no worship going on. You guys were a long ways uh, away from God. Things weren't going well for you. What had happened to your sense of well-being? As I read that, I thought their sense of well-being was gone. Because every time they went to try to achieve something, it wasn't there. You know, you go to a stack of this many bricks to retrieve bricks, but there's only half of them there. You go to get the wine out of the wine vat, there's only half of it there that you expected. Everything's a little disappointing. It's not the well-being you desired. God says, now think about that. Your life may not be falling into line like you always thought it should be. The, the implication is there's a reason, and God's going to get to that, Okay. Personal failure was one thing. Secondly, in verse 17, he talks about divine discipline. So, did you notice how I was involved with you during that time? During that time, nothing really succeeded. I struck your hand. Everything your hand did with mildew, with rot, it didn't, it didn't turn out right. You were working harder. You were running faster and getting farther behind. The harder you worked, the behinder you got. And, and as we face life, I've had to come to that stark realization from time to time in my own experiences in, in trying to do what I think is God's work and realize, wait a minute, what am I actually pursuing here and why isn't it panning out? Maybe I've left an important thing out of the equation and that is God's place in these plans and in these activities I've delved into. How can I honor God in that? And so he says, divine discipline is part of it. His desire is for relationships with his people. Why did he strike their work? So they would return to him. Did they return to him? No. You know, and I say this all the time, you know, what does God have to do to convince you that his word is true and that it's to be obeyed? What would he have to do? And for most of us, the thing we may identify that God would have to do, he's probably done in your life. But you're ignoring it. You're stepping away from the reality. And yet in verse 18, and this is what I love, and this is what we're really getting to in this passage. In verses 18 and 19, it talks about God's blessing. Start out with personal failure, shifted to divine discipline. Now we have God's blessing. And he says again, for the second time in these few verses, Give careful thought. All right? Think about yourself. Think about your own situation. Nothing you've done has really succeeded. And because the baseline for their life was not focused on an honest assessment of their own guilt. This is extremely important that as Christians we learn how to make an honest assessment of our spiritual life. The reason we struggle with that is it's not easy and simple. It means listening to what the Holy Spirit says. The reason we fail at it so much, we try to simplify it. We try to make a checklist. This is how I assess my spiritual life. Did I go to church? Yeah. Did I put money in the offering? Yep. Okay. Did I say a nice thing to somebody at the store today? Yep. Okay, there's an extra one. I get a brownie point for that. You know, we do that, don't we? That's not really what it means. It means spending time alone with God and allowing Him to give us that sense of where we are with Him. And so he says for a third time in those few verses, verse 18, give careful thought, give careful thought, give careful thought, give careful thought. What do you think God wants us to do? Give careful thought to the way we live. When God repeats something three times, you want to pay attention, okay? Peace and contentment aren't there, but that doesn't mean God can't bless us. 
You know why? Because his favor is undeserved. I'm a rat. I don't deserve God's blessing. I don't deserve health. I don't deserve prosperity. I don't deserve security. I don't deserve happiness. I don't. Those aren't things I deserve. If I have them, that's God's grace. And if I don't have the bad things that are happening in the world, that's God's mercy. Because I deserve them. I deserve for my flesh to rot off my bones. In God's eyes, he says all your righteousnesses are like filthy rags, like diseased rags. We've got nothing to offer God. And yet, God's blessing is there. In fact, he says at the end of verse 19, from this day on I'll bless you. I thought that was so weird the first time I read it. He's telling them all these things they didn't do. You didn't do this, you didn't do that, you're not doing this right, you're not doing that right. All this defilement's taking place and everything. And he says, yeah, from this day on I'll bless you. Why is that? Because God's a gracious God who loves us. We don't deserve any of it. We don't deserve any of it. And we'll go on and understand that a little better, that it all really boils down to God's work. But in Romans 6.23, we're told about this right at the, from the point of, of turning to Jesus Christ. It says, for the wages of sin is death. And if all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, the wages for that is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The gift of God is eternal life. The gift my kids didn't deserve their gifts. I gave them to them because I loved them. I didn't say, how good have you been this year? Have you ever given me grief this year? I'll decide if I'm going to give you a gift or not. Some people might do that, but that's not the way God works. He said, from this day on, I'll bless you. And that's where we get into verses 20 through 23, which sound like an add on a totally different subject, but it's not. It's all grouped together because this is God's work among God's people. And if we're going to talk about what it means to be involved with bringing back worship, we have to understand this, that God spoke to Haggai again on the same day. And it even emphasizes that in the passage. A second time on the 24th day of the month, he wants him to go talk to Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was a governor, all right? And he tells him, I'm going to shake the earth. Back in verse 6 of chapter 2, he said the exact same thing to the general population. I'm going to shake the earth. Why was that so important for him to deliver that message to Zerubbabel, the governor? When you think about it, sometimes politicians and government people get the idea that they control the world, even small towns. And what God is emphasizing to Zerubbabel is you're in a position to understand that I'm the one in control. That I can shake the world even if you think the world is orderly. So there's a universal ability identified by God, identical to verse 6, about shaking the earth again. All right. Secondly, he talks about earthly powers in verse 22. And if you look down at verse 22, what's he say? I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of the foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers. Horses and their riders will fail or fall each by the sword of his brother. What's God saying to him about earthly powers? God's saying, I'll overturn them. I'll overthrow them. And you know why I'm telling you, Zerubbabel? Because you've been sitting on your hands because of a foreign power's orders to you. You don't think I can handle that? I can. Now, he didn't tell Zerubbabel, so arm your residents of Jerusalem and form a revolt. He said, no, get your orientation back on me. Trust me to deliver you because I can do this. I, am, I have universal ability. I, have, I can control the earthly powers, and I have divine authority. On that day, in verse 23, declares the Lord Almighty, on that day, when he begins to work, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, declares the Lord, and I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. And I thought, wow, why is he saying all that neat stuff to Zerubbabel? Who is he? Well, he was the governor, right? He was there 20 years before. He was the one that had to read the pronouncement from the emperor that said, cease and desist. 
He's been wondering what to do ever since then. He's been trying to organize this people without regard for the, for the rebuilding or not of the temple. And yet he knows he was there to rebuild the temple. It's not happening the way he wanted it to happen. It's not on his schedule. What am I going to do about that? God comes to him in his grace and his mercy and says, Zerubbabel, listen to me. i got an important message. You're going to be like my signet ring. I go way beyond the emperors of Persia. If I sign something and my ring is stamped on that document, it has clout. And he tells Zerubbabel that because Zerubbabel needs to hear that God is really in charge, but he goes so far beyond that. And listen what he says. I'll make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. And prior to that, he calls him my servant. You see, divine authority for God's people means we become servants of God. My servant. But he's not just identifying us as my servant. He says, you're the one I've chosen. Now, he says that to Zerubbabel, but you've got to realize that same idea. Jesus communicated to his followers in John chapter 15, in verse 19, when he talked to them and he says, you belonged to the world. And he could be saying that to each of us, couldn't he? You belong to the world. It would love you as its own if you belong to the world. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. So what he's saying is the same exalted position that Zerubbabel had we have available to us to be chosen by God to be his servant is an awesome blessing, undeserved. None of us deserve it. If we realize that what the Bible teaches is that we're born sinful, we don't acquire sin as we age, we are born in that condition. Therefore, nothing we can ever do can ever undo that. It took God stepping into human history, offering a perfect sacrifice for sin so that sin was paid for, for all of humanity, and then God chose us to be His servants out of that. What a privilege. What a privilege you have. What a privilege I have to be a part of what was going on in the world and what is going on in the world. Where Haggai's first message was one of indictment, calling the people guilty, in this second part, he talks about how great and blessed the future of the people of God is. We have a great and blessed future, folks. That has never changed. No matter how bleak life feels, the promises of God stand because they are based on Jesus' shed blood. The new covenant in his blood that we talk about every time we take communion. That covenant in blood is something binding that God won't ignore. He's always honored that covenant. He always will honor that covenant. We have a great and blessed future. We have a lot to look forward to. We can actively bring back worship as we respond to our inherent sense of defilement and yet realize that God has cleansed us. You know, in conclusion, God knows you. God knows how undeserving you are. But his undeserved failure is available because Jesus took your place. Jesus took your place. Let's pray. Lord, as we contemplate this, your word, as we realize once again how great and gracious and loving and merciful of a God we serve, I really, really thank you Thank you for the book of Haggai. Thank you for the challenge that lies before your people. And I pray that you will take this portion of the word, bring it to our minds throughout the week, help us to rest completely on the very nature of the God we love and serve. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.